What's up, Sinisa? Super Bad Estrada here, and I just want to give a huge special shout out to the relay. Thank you so much for all of the continuous support, and thank you for all of the support during and after and before every single fight. Welcome to the mother relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Charles Martin had this to say. He said Kovnowski was pretty fucked up. Don't know if he can come back from the loss. He was quoted as saying, I don't know, man. I don't know. He was pretty fucked up. He was pretty bad. He got knocked down the first time, and then he got up too quick. He was already hurt. And then he went down again with the boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. He knocked him down again. He got up. But then he was just beating him into submission. That wasn't a good thing for him. He took a lot of punches. Portion of the article reads, Kaunaki's chin had been one of his best attributes during a run that included victories over Artur Spilka, Iago Kalidze, Charles Martin, Gerald Washington, and Chris Ariola. He caught him with that counterpunch, Martin said, referring to Hellenius. It was two counterpunches back to back. His punches, he had that snap on them, you know? He was snapping them. That hurts. He was breaking his ass down. He had to back up in the first round. He had to back up a little bit. Like, yo, this ain't no average Joe. Because he usually tries to walk everybody down. But Hellenius, he was throwing them punches. He was snapping them. I wasn't surprised, Martin said of Kovnowski's loss to Hellenius. It was just because I was off for a long time before fighting Kovnowski. It's just a different thing because the counter punch is everything. When you're catching guys between these shots, that's what really hurts a man. You can pummel a guy and beat him up all you want. But if they're bracing for it, you know, it's fine if you can see it. Hellenius did an awesome job. Hellenius is a big dude, a big man that can punch. So anything is possible. He went out there and showed that on that night. It was spectacular. You know, hindsight being 2020, one is left to wonder if Adam Kovnowski's showing against Chris Ariola wasn't a foreshadowing, a omen, a bad omen of things to come. Those two guys, they went balls to the wall with each other. They actually broke the record, the CompuBox record, for the most punches thrown, combined punches by the two combatants, in a heavyweight match, both Adam and Chris. And it was an entertaining fight, though entertainment value isn't what we're assessing here. It really is. Chris Ariola is a journeyman. God bless him and his family, but that's what he is at this point. He's a journeyman, 38 years old. And Adam Kovnowski, unbeaten Adam Kovnowski, has to go balls to the wall to win a decision against the 38-year-old Chris Ariola. Perspective is key here, folks. Adam Kovnowski had turned down an opportunity to fight Anthony Joshua as a stand-in opponent for Jarrell Miller, who we all know got popped for every performance-enhancing drug under the sun. Adam turned down an opportunity to fight that guy because reportedly he wasn't in shape. Moves on from that to fight Chris Ariola, And in the Chris Ariola fight, entertaining fight that it might have been, he had to go balls to the wall to beat that guy. A journeyman. I mean, never mind that you passed on a multi-million dollar opportunity to become a unified world champion in one fell swoop so you could end up losing to Robert Hellenius two fights later for $100,000. Something like that. <laughs> never mind that. Yes. What we're assessing here is that perhaps the signs were already there. What? The signs of complacency and regression. Oh. That an unbeaten up-and-comer, the likes of an Adam Kovnowski, shouldn't have to go balls to the wall with a journeyman like Chris Ariola. I say regression because Adam seemed to have been coming along nicely, winning the fights he's supposed to be able to win, passing the necessary tests, you know. He fought guys that could punch. He did. Beat guys that could punch. Iago Kalidze, it's one of them. That's the same Iago Kalidze that dropped the unbeaten F.A. Ajagba. Oh. Adam beat that guy. Adam fought Charles Martin, who has a pretty hefty knockout ratio. Pretty hefty knockout percentage. Southpaw, big guy, big kid. They fought two years ago. Adam beat him, too. So it seemed like Adam was winning the kind of fights he was supposed to be able to win, and he was doing it in pretty good fashion. Yeah. And somewhere, somehow, things just started going sideways. Things just started going backwards. He started regressing. He must have. The moment you get a phone call, to fight the likes of an Anthony Joshua for three world titles at MSG. Multi-million dollar opportunity. And your answer to this opportunity is that you're not in shape, so you're not going to do it, only so that you could go balls to the wall with Chris Ariola and end up losing to the likes of a Robert Hellenius. That indicates regression. Especially when you're the same guy that beat Charles Martin, Iago Kalidze, Artur Spilka. I mean, you fought some guys. That's regression. You were on the right track, and for whatever reason, that changed. 
Perhaps Adam was expecting Robert Hellenius to simply lay down in front of him. Perhaps Adam was expecting that Robert didn't really come to win, he just came for a check. And Robert, quite unpleasantly, surprised him. You get accustomed to these kinds of situations. You're fighting a 38-year-old Chris Ariola. You're fighting the likes of a Robert Hellenius. And you're not on your P's and Q's for these kinds of guys, these kinds of fighters, the way you would be if it were an Anthony Joshua opposite the ring from you, a Deontay Wilder, a Tyson Fury opposite the ring from you. You know, if it's those guys, you're going to be on your A game. You better bring it. You better. But if you're fighting an over-the-hill Chris Ariola or a Robert Hellenius, you figure it was going to be an easy night. And those two fights were anything but easy nights for Adam Kovnoski. Moving forward, I don't know what he's going to do. It's not at all inappropriate to ask... Can he bounce back? Particular to Adam Kovnoski's implementation. He's a come-forward, aggressive, mauler, volume puncher, that kind of guy. Up until this Hellenius fight, Adam's chin was never in question, you understand. And that chin of his, that beard, it's a necessary component for him to maintain that base style of his. He wants to walk a guy down, let his hands go, overwhelm him with volume punching, as opposed to concussive power, because Adam's not the biggest puncher. He wears guys down by letting his hands go, by letting the fists fly. And you need a sturdy beard for that. But how sturdy is your beard when you can't take what Robert Hellenius has got? I mean, Gerald Washington did okay. Dillian White did okay. You, you hit the deck. Was it two times in that fight? It is the heavyweight division. That being said, you're always one punch away from being put down, from being put out. There's that to consider. But unique to Adam Kovnoski's implementation, this is what he does, you know. Walks a guy down, tries to beat him into submission, overwhelming his opponent with volume. What happens when you're getting caught between the punches? What happens when what's working for you is working against you? Do you have the boxing acumen to try something else? Because you might have to. That's reality. What won you? The Charles Martin fight? What won you? The Iago Kaladze fight? The Artur Spilka fight? What won you those fights? Didn't help you this time, but actually worked against you. Does Adam Kovnoski have it within him to bounce back from this, or is he going to proceed doing things the way he's been doing things because, in the realm of skills, boxing acumen, he has hit his ceiling? Well, there really is only one way to find out. In other news, per a tweet from Steve Kemp, Jose Benavidez Sr. says that if his son David is offered a fight with Canelo, they would absolutely not hesitate to accept that assignment. Oh, really? Then why is Samson Lukowicz, David Benavidez's manager, hesitating to accept Caleb Plant as an assignment? Any ideas? We talked about it here on the channel extensively for those interested in that video. I'll leave the link to it in the description box. Box. What are we as the boxing community supposed to believe here? That David Benavidez is ready for a Canelo Alvarez, but he's not ready for a Caleb Plant? What? Because Caleb Plant is so much more proven than Canelo? I mean, what the hell's going on here? You know what it looks like to me? This looks like another one of those COVID-19 call-outs to where people know certain fights can't happen, so all sorts of name-dropping goes on. I'm not against David Benavidez getting this fight. I'm a boxing fan. If you can get David in the ring with Canelo, I'm gonna watch it. But let's not kid ourselves here. It's all kinds of guys running around using Canelo Alvarez's name to get themselves attention in situations that they know aren't realistic. Because all of a sudden, the PBC loves working with Golden Boy, right? Right. I expect this to be the first of many of these kinds of comments, many of these kinds of call-outs, now that Canelo Alvarez is descending from light heavyweight into the super middleweight division, the same division where David Benavidez holds the WBC title. You gotta use your common sense here. If a fight between David and Caleb remains elusive in spite of the fact that they're on the same side of the street, what makes you think everybody's on board to lock horns with Canelo Alvarez? Exactly. It's very easy to use that guy's name to have articles written about you and your son because that's how this reads to me. And Canelo is very popular. Everybody wants him or everybody says that they want him. That's what they say. But it's a uh, bit of a tough sell for me when I see... Team Benavidez saying they wouldn't hesitate to lock horns with Canelo while simultaneously hesitating to lock horns with Caleb Plant. Really shouldn't be a lot, a whole lot, stopping that fight from happening, but guess what? 
that fight isn't about to happen. So when you bring up the name of Canelo... It feels disingenuous. What I am expecting for David Benavidez is for things to proceed as planned. He's likely gonna come back and fight Roma Angulo like he was supposed to before everything got shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. He's likely gonna fight Roma Angulo and he's gonna move on from that and fight Avni Yildirim. You ask me what I'm expecting to see, that's what I'm expecting to see. You can say Canelo's name till you're blue in the face. You can say that you'd accept that assignment in a heartbeat, that you wouldn't hesitate. You can say that stuff all fucking day, man. You wouldn't be the first guy. I heard that shit from. Ultimately, I don't think that these talks are going to materialize into anything tangible anywhere in the near future. And finally, the WBC president defends his decision to make Vasil Lomachenko a franchise champion. He was quoted as saying, Well, I see an opportunity for great matches to happen, to get more excitement going on. Fortuna and Campbell will fight for the interim title. They had signed to fight for the title. Now Haney, with his time, he has healed. So there you have an opportunity for many great fights, Suleiman told. Teofimo Lopez is a sensational attraction. Lomachenko, Fortuna, Campbell, Haney. So they have two years of great activity that could be happening. I choose the way of giving fans, millions of fans, great fights, which is what the sport is all about. If that will have a few not happy, a few confused, so be it. But I prefer to take the great activity in the ring, to give millions of fans great fights. Well, that's not your job. You're not a manager. You're not a promoter. It's not your job to give millions of fans great fights. Your job, ideally, as the president of a sanctioning body, is to give the sport its structure. Its pecking order. No more, no less. That is the WBC's role in all of this, and really, any sanctioning body's role, to give the sport its structure by ranking these fighters in accordance with the contests they participate in. That's it. The contests that these sanctioning bodies sanction, yet time and time again, what the WBC seems to do Fuck up shit. is convolute things unnecessarily. I mean, here you have Mauricio Suleiman defending the decision to make this franchise shit. But really think about this for a second. How has this franchise designation was cooked up by the WBC? How has this franchise designation changed anything in the lightweight division? Huh? What has it done exactly? Huh? Teofimo Lopez was already in hot pursuit of Vasil Lomachenko before he became a franchise champion, so... What difference does that franchise shit make? If anything, you have now deprived Teofimo Lopez of the opportunity of fighting Vasil Lomachenko for the undisputed lightweight championship because per the WBC's own rules, franchise status is not something that can be won in combat. It cannot be transferred. Most he's gonna get is a diamond belt if he wins. Think about it for a second. How does the presence of a franchise champion bring us closer to seeing one guy holding all the belts? When, if Teofimo Lopez actually beats Vasil Lomachenko, he won't be the lightweight division's undisputed champion. He won't. Franchise status is non-transferable and... All you get is a trinket if you beat a franchise champion. But if by some chance, Vasil Lomachenko wins and he beats Teofimo Lopez, takes his belt, you're expecting us to recognize him as an undisputed champion? How's that work? Wait. You're basically saying that the only way this is an undisputed title fight is if Vasil Lomachenko wins. But if he loses, that's what it ain't. Because the only WBC champion at lightweight with a title that can be unified is Devin Haney, not Vasil Lomachenko. The WBC has effectively created a designation that makes it that much harder to bring absolution to these weight classes via an undisputed champion. I mean, you tell me, how's this franchise status, how's this franchise designation make boxing better? Explain it to me. What powers does this enable the likes of a Canelo Alvarez to have that he didn't already have? Before this franchise shit. You know he was already one of the most sought after boxers before he was labeled a franchise champion. He was. The rule seems to be that a franchise champion has the luxury of moving up or down to any prescribed weight class he feels like moving into and challenging that division's WBC champion, but guess what? What? Canelo Alvarez was more or less already able to do that. This is a guy with no shortage of options. He didn't need some made-up designation to get what fights he wants to have whenever he wants to have them. So what difference does this franchise title make? Beats me. 
Canelo Alvarez doesn't need to be labeled a franchise champion to get the kind of fights that he wants to have. He gets what he wants when he wants it, more or less. Doesn't he? If anything, the only change that this franchise designation has affected is it allows the WBC to tag along for all of Canelo Alvarez's fights because he's their quote-unquote franchise champion, which is more or less what I think they wanted. The same applies to Vasil Lomachenko. Yeah, it does. Granted, it's on a smaller scale, but the same applies. It does. This franchise designation is little more than an avenue, a vehicle for the WBC to stay in the business of certain fighters. It allows them to tag along with these fighters wherever those fighters might go, even if those fighters aren't necessarily competing for one of their titles. This keeps the WBC in the business of a Canelo, in the business of a Lomachenko. That's all it really does. A prime example would be, by some chance, Canelo Alvarez descends to 168 pounds, like we're all expecting him to, and he fights the likes of a Billy Joe Saunders. The WBC can thereby attach themselves to that event now, due to Canelo Alvarez's franchise status. In the absence of that franchise status, well, the WBC wouldn't have nothing to do with that fight. But since he's the franchise champion, they get to tag along. But you tell me, do you consider Canelo versus Saunders a unification match? Do you? Because it's a situation to where Canelo Alvarez can win Billy's WBO, but Billy can't win Canelo's franchise status or franchise belt or whatever the fuck it is. So would you call that a unification fight? Was Canelo's last fight a unification fight? The one with Sergei Kovalev. Were there two world titles on the line or was it just one? Sergei's. The rule seems to be that a fighter and his team have to petition for franchise status and said status is only approved by the WBC themselves. Better still, the primary function that this designation seems to serve is to allow the WBC to tag along with a fighter for events they wouldn't otherwise be involved in. That seems to be it. So you tell me how this designation is making boxing better when for all intents and purposes, it seems to be diluting the sport of boxing. Further. Just another trinket or just another designation that makes it that much more confusing to the casual observer. This designation hasn't empowered the likes of a Canelo Alvarez to do anything that he wasn't able to do before. And in the case of the lightweight division, they have created a complex situation that could end up depriving us of seeing an undisputed champion in that weight class. And Mauricio Suleiman thinks this is what's best for boxing? Yeah, right.